My dear amigos, welcome to the Inevitable Podcast. I'm your host, Pedro Soren. As you know, I'm a VC, author, and entrepreneur, also the founder and managing partner at Atman. Uh, we're a close community of founders and investors playing long-term games together. And as you know, my mission is to partner with inevitable people. As always, at, on the Inevitable Podcast, we tend to have inevitable people. And in this episode, you know, I had the honor of talking uh, to my friend, uh, Rodrigo Tejero. He's the founder of RecargaPay, or RecargaPay, depending on your English uh, or Spanish levels. Uh, but, you know, irrespective of that, RecargaPay is a leading mobile payments fintech in Brazil that has reached more than three and a half million monthly active users. He started the company in 2010, has more than 300 employees across Sao Paulo, Rio, Buenos Aires, and our dear Miami. Uh, Recarga Pay is currently EBITDA positive with a revenue run rate of over $50 million. They have recently raised a $70 million Series C, adding up to a total of about $100 million in venture financing. Some of their investors include Fuel Venture Capital, IDC Ventures, ATW Partners, Funders Club, where I started my career in venture, uh, FJ Labs, and a few others. Rodrigo is a serial entrepreneur and had multiple businesses in different industries. It's a fascinating uh, story. And in this episode, we walk through each step of his journey. I learned a lot, and I'm confident you will as well. So welcome to another episode of the Inevitable Podcast. <laughs> I'm excited for a very excited for our episode because I know that uh, we we haven't spent that much time together, but I believe that we share a lot of uh, similar values and principles. And uh, and, I, and I don't know, there's just something that's like I know, and I meet the people that are pretty similar in in, in what I think it's important in life. And I'm certainly you, know, you are you know one of them. So, well, thank you for the invitation. For me, it's a it's a pleasure. I, I really don't do many of these podcast ever so and 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 if it's going to be talking about the history it's a long history of a lot of about a lot of stuff so uh, i think it's going to be fun and probably i'm going to learn a lot about just talking about these things <laughs> oh that's great that's great well i um I, i'd love to you know oftentimes like we start with that moment on you know on your journey as a founder which is not you know like the moment that you're you know starting uh, something like Ricardo Pay and raise hundreds of millions of dollars. It's like that first time in your life that you make money out of like your own creation. It's like that energy of uh, the energy of, uh, of of volition, right? So basically, um, you started earning money by buying and selling stuff in school. I love it because it's, it's how I started as well. So will yeah. you tell your story first? Yeah, yeah. So so it was fun because like. When I was a teenager, I, I used to like I had this this format that whatever thing I would do, like go to a restaurant, I would try to calculate how much money they were selling, and 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 and, and think, I would go on an airplane and think, okay, how much are they selling all these tickets for? And I would just like brainstorm and just count stuff, you know, and fi and try to figure out what the business was behind it, and. And, and, and I realized that one of the things like in, in my experience that I could sell is I went to the U.S. a couple of times when I was when I was young with my family and I used to play Nintendo a lot and uh, games, right? Super Mario Brothers. Uh, I mean, you had Tetris there and, and, and things of sort on uh, Zelda. And in Argentina, it was extremely expensive uh, to buy uh, these games. It was mostly like double that you would get in, in the U.S., mostly because... Uh, taxes when you imported stuff of that sort were super high. So if you wanted to buy a new game, instead of paying 40 bucks, it would be like 80 or $100 in, in, in Argentina. So I realized that, look, my dad was paying for the trip to the US and I said, you know what? I could buy some games and then go back to Argentina and sell them. And uh, so, so I started like a very basic, right? I mean, it was just our pure arbitration. Uh, and, and, and every time I flew, I like bought stuff and then sold it back home in, in a sense. That was like the, 
that I recall, like the the um, the, the first like business I, I I did, which is very basic in a sense, and uh, and I did a couple hundred dollars with that, and it was like, and then you started realizing taxes, how they affect countries and things of sort. And I was very interested in, in in why countries grew, right? And this was like always concerning for me. Why do I have to pay more for this here, and uh, it's just cheaper over there, right? I love it. Yeah. It's funny. I, um, even to this date, sometimes I think about stuff like that. Even now I just had lunch and, you know, I order it through like a pickup. Uh, it's, I am a very, I'm a creature of habit. So there's this place, you know, nearby here, uh, in, in Brickles uh, called rice, right? The little Mediterranean bowl. <laughs> I think I've ordered the same thing there like more than 15 times, but today I was busy. So I decided to like order through a, a pickup with uber eats eats versus actually going there you know it's like why is it three dollars more expensive and now you know if you order through uber eats even if you're picking it up you're paying for uber eats's uh revenue share (laughs) yeah Um, so and i think that i it's interesting because as a kid i was wired that way as well and i find that the best founders you know it's this combination of curiosity and this uh almost an indomitable desire of um to just make progress right um, yeah, and, and also, I think there was one big issue I always thought was that if you just did like one dollar every day and you and, and like everything that I thought, I just multiplied by 365. Right. So if you just did one dollar today, that's three hundred sixty five dollars at the end of the year. If you did just ten dollars, it would be three thousand six hundred you did a hundred. You know, I just and, and, and thinking about things of that sort. And, and then I would actually. I had this, this format where I used to go to, to, to lunch at school and my dad would pay for, for the lunch in school. And, and I asked him, how much are you paying for that? And, and, and he said, I don't remember exactly how much it was, but I told him, look, give me that money and I'll buy my food uh, somewhere else. And he actually gave it to me and I, and I saved like half of it, you know, <laughs> and I said, that was another way of, of making money is actually saving money. Right. So, uh, early on also the issue of just not just building business and making a difference, but saving is also a big way of, of making a difference. If you can save like three bucks every, uh, every day, that's a thousand dollars at the end of the year and a thousand dollars at, at 13, I mean, it was a big deal, you know? Yes, I love it. You're annualizing your allowance already. What's uh-huh. your, yeah. your allowance is <laughs> ARR. <laughs> or your, uh, <laughs> it's great. Exactly. Uh, uh-huh. So, and then, and in 97, you open up an E Trade account with some of that money, right? Yeah. So, so actually, I did this business of arbitration and, and saving money. I also, like in 94, I was one of the first, uh, we were one of the first neighborhoods that had a cable modem uh, internet. And uh, I actually This is also, in Argentina. This is in Argentina, yeah. Uh, the other thing I, that I did was started to sell uh, MP3s and, and movies, uh, like burning them into CDs. So um, uh, that's something that I did. And that was very profitable business. I mean, it was, I, I sold like for 20 bucks and then, you know, it was for free. You could download everything, burn it, and and I would make a significant amount. Of narrow, that. right? Narrow burning yeah. room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, so at the end, when I was like eighteen, I had like five thousand dollars I had saved in in doing all these things. It's, it's not not huge, but uh, it it was meaningful. And um, and 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 as just an observer of Argentina and how. So many years, you know, the country has been going down over the decades. I was very always very interested in many issues, but the one I got more uh, answers was just economics. My, my, my dad is a PhD in, 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 in the University of Chicago and in economics. And I would always be curious about multiple issues. But whenever I would ask stuff of, of politics or economics, my dad would be there, you know, uh, sharing his thoughts and, and, and things of sort. So. Uh, I got to learn a lot uh, from that. And I early on, I said, look, if you try to understand the world through economics, then you should be able to predict what happens, right? So for me, the stock market was a way of saying, okay, I have an, a hypothesis of what's going to happen. So I should be able to profit from, from that in a sense. And E-Trade 
had just opened up and, and, and I was fascinated by, by the internet, right? I mean, this concept that from your home, you could sell to millions of people uh, stuff, you know, it was amazing, but you could also do it. You could start buying and selling stock from your home and, and things of the sort. So I did a joint account with, with, with my dad. I put those $5,000 in the E-Trade account and I started studying also economics that year in, in, in Universidad San Andres in Argentina. And, um, and it was a very, uh, very particular time, right? It was this internet boom. It was like everything was, was growing. You had crazy IPOs, uh, geo cities, like, I don't know, having IPO and the, the, the the, the IPO price multiplied by six on, 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 uh, on that. That is a, it's a, it's a Fred Wilson investment. I think before he started a union square ventures, he, he's a, he's Steve Patternot and, uh, and he's an actually uh, an angel investor of, 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 of my company. <laughs> I love it. Crazy. And, um, so, so like for a year and a half, I was just day trading, uh, you know, stocks, uh, I was how old, how old were you? I was 18. I was 18 at that time. I love and, it. Day trading at 18. So but you you, you I mean um, you know a lot of basically for me you know I identify who are the people that I think make sense to be on this show uh, for a multitude of reasons but you know Matt our producer does this like remarkable work on getting all of us ready and one thing he has here on your notes is that your net worth went from five thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars. Were you eighteen when that happened? Yeah, so so I was nineteen and a half. So it took me a year and a half to go from five thousand to a hundred thousand. In in and I said, no, wow. I mean, this is it. This is what I want to do, right? I mean, it was like uh, <laughs> if I'm studying to actually make money, why don't I just do this uh, for a life, right? So what happened? And and for me, this was a, a very important turning point in in my life. I started, uh, you know. Doing riskier and riskier bets, right? So, um, you taking started, margin? Were you leveraging, or, or? I, I leveraged a little bit uh, initially, but what happened was that I started playing with uh, uncovered calls, and uh, and and I started to be very aggressive on on earnings days and things of the sort. And I I remember one day that it was the earning call for Amazon. And and I and I put a big bet uh, uh, in 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 some options for Amazon, and like in a day I lost like seventy percent of everything that I had. You know, I went from a hundred thousand to I said if I got to a hundred thousand, I can go to a million, right? So I said, <laughs> and and I. <laughs> I went really aggressive on it. I lost like seventy thousand dollars. It's like in one day, you know. And it's like, wow. <laughs> that, and then and I, nineteen. <laughs> yeah. So so then I started to think about it, and I said, you know what? Maybe I just was lucky, you know, getting from five thousand to hundred thousand. And I started to rationalize it, like, look, this has been just an incredible boom you know, in these last couple of years, and probably like anything that you would bet on, it would go up. And, and I said that, look, maybe I'm not playing this right. Maybe I have to start my own company and then go to the public market in a sense. <laughs> so I, I was just like testing stuff out, right? It was more like, it, it, you know, it, I did stuff, you know, I, I was curious and, and I tested things out and, and I said, okay, so I believe that I don't have enough information uh, to actually make the best calls. I need I need to learn more and and, and things of that sort. And I said, you know what? Maybe I'll 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 just never be uh, uh, have the information. I mean, I started thinking maybe there's insider uh, information people have uh, for certain things, and 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 I, I kind of decided like, you know what? I'll keep those thirty thousand, and and I stopped investing. Uh, at that time. And, and so this was like, uh, 1999. And then I started thinking what internet company I could start. And, uh, at, at that time, uh, for me, the only company that made sense was a marketplace, uh, was like an eBay, right? Uh, it was the, 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 the quintessential uh, I think uh, business model that just made a lot of sense in, in uh, from from day one in, in the internet. You know, buying and selling stuff online, it was just extremely efficient. 
and uh, I was still studying in 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 school, and um, I had actually when I was day trading, I actually did a a, a site called Freedom to Invest dot com dot ar, which if you see it, I mean, it would be very similar to what you see today in finance.yahoo.com. I, I did a website where you had uh, you, you had all the, the ticker quotes, you have news feeds, uh, you had um, graphs and, 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 and everything, one single place. And that site appeared in La Nación, which is the most important newspaper in, in Buenos Aires. And I had two names. It was Freedom to Invest in English and it was Los Mercados dot com dot ar and it actually appeared in la nacion and uh, and i was just using it as a as a resource for me and what was interesting is that somebody picked it up and actually called me and uh, this was a very well-known uh, investor and architect in argentina and once i got together with him we were talking about stocks you know about uh, ebay about yahoo and and and, all, and geocities and all these different uh, companies and models, and it was fascinating. I was very young at, at that age; I was on nineteen or or something. It was or twenty already. And he told me, "Look, I have my my daughter that is coming from Harvard wants to start a business, and his boyfriend, which comes from Brown, uh, also, and they want to start something out. And I think you should meet them." And um, and you you coded the the the, the entire website or. Yeah, it was just basic HTML. You know, it's very basic, uh, very basic. I, I learned a little bit. You know, you could copy paste and, and do, um, but I, I could manage. You know, I, I could manage with some code. With I had FTP files, uh, FTP. You know that you can uh, upload and download uh, files and, and yes, but Dreamweaver. Those are the <laughs> Dreamweaver, man. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I used to use it. That was like magic for people that didn't know much. <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, so I, I, I get to meet this guy. He presents me his daughter and his boyfriend. And uh, and this investor puts like $500,000 into a startup. And they invite me to be part of that startup. But they hadn't decided. This was like... Early 1999, it was probably like May or something like that. And I was still studying. It was my third year in, in economics. And, uh, but I was fascinated by, by all of this, right? So, um, they, they, they give me an offer to, to work with them. I would be like the, 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 the product guy, right? And, uh, I'm the, I'm the person that knew, uh, how, how a website had to be and uh, how you could generate traffic. And I understood the business models and, and things of the sort. And you understood the internet. They just wanted to be entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can understand. And then they, they, they just want to figure out somehow to do something. Right. And, um, and, and, and from there, you know, I, I decided to, to take this, this opportunity. And I actually decided to drop out of school, uh, which was crazy at that time. Uh, yeah, I wonder how your PhD father responded to that. No, look, I, I, I had never seen my dad so disappointed in, in, in my life. I mean, and my mom, it was, my mom is like, it was his eldest uh, boy. I mean, I have two uh, older sisters, but I was the, the uh, oldest boy and I had a, uh, um, a, a brother and for her it was like, what? You're, you're not going to have a, a, a university title. It was like the worst thing that could ever happen, you know? And, uh, and, uh, but I just felt, you know, it wasn't like, I, I learned a lot of economics on my own All, through my dad, a lot of inspiration through there, but I, I read a lot on my own, you know? So, uh, I just learned a lot of stuff on my own and, uh, and, and I just thought the, the university was just being um, too mathematical on everything that we were doing in economics. And a lot of people just didn't understand anything about economics. They just really knew how to do really great models. And, um, and, 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 and I thought that I wasn't learning that much right there. And, 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 and I also realized that I was never going to work as an economist. I realized that uh, I felt that I had to do things, you know, I had to prove my hypothesis and, 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 and things of the sort. 
I understand. I the only reason why I didn't drop out was because uh, you know I studied journalism. Journalism school is, is a joke. It's just so easy that like it's um, um, there was. I mean, I was still like, okay, I'm gonna finish this. You know, just kind of like. Uh, but uh, I have a, a very specific view on uh, uh, college in general. I think it's extremely important to go to college and start and live two years or so with people that are the same age group in this safe, semi-contained environment. We are having a lot of first-time experiences as an adult without your parents there uh, to kind of help you in one way or the other. For me, that is extremely valuable. If you're not um, studying for a technical degree, so you don't want to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, um, that uh, and, and then I, I suspect that graduating is not as important as just spending those two to three years in this semi-safe bubble. And... Basically, because for the types of success that we look for as investors, I honestly don't see a correlation. There's none. So much about principle values, it's humility, ability to learn, desire to succeed, uh, recycle yourself and so forth. So I wonder for you, as you run, uh, you know, Recarga Pay uh, in I, I, I don't know how many people you guys have in total and how do you think about recruiting and uh, where did these people went, you know, where do they go to school or not and how important that is? Yeah, well, uh, today we have 350 people, um, mostly in Brazil. We still have, we have people in Argentina, Mexico, France, Barcelona, the U.S., things of the sort. Um, I... I definitely do not see the GPA of people. I don't think anybody does nowadays in, in, in any uh, curriculum and, and the sort. I think it's after having interviewed thousands of people over the last 20 years, uh, if there's something that I've learned, like, which, which is pretty interesting is that if you, if you interview somebody, but at the end you have a gut feeling that although everything looks great, but you just, there's something that you don't know how to explain it, but it doesn't close. B, uh, that intuition is in, that gut instinct is incredibly powerful. And it goes both ways in a sense. Once you feel that it's the right person and you don't know exactly how to explain it after having done a thousand interviews, right? I mean, probably early on. I didn't get it, but but now I, I, I value my intuition and my gut instinct on, on people uh, tremendously. And, um, and and because I've been able to see that, you know, when I, I made a, a ton of mistakes, I, I used to probably look at schools, I would look at what they accomplished and things of the sort. And then I realized, you know what, I think it's more of a personality traits that you have to look into. Does this person love to learn does this does this per person take ownership on 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 the things that that had, had that he takes does he have initiative you know it's like not just following one path but you know initiative on on doing different things in in a sense has he failed uh, dramatically and how has he uh, surpassed that that that, that and, and responded to that so um you know, it's, it's, and does he, does, does he do other things besides just uh, on, on school and work? Um, and, um, I think all those things in conjunction, uh, make for, for, for a big difference, I think, to how people were hired in the past, I suppose. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I would say that that gut feeling applies also in the business of investing. Um, you know, none. Of, I, I I suspect that in the past seven years, I've invested in seventy five different companies and the across multiple different firms. And that gut feeling, even when it, the person checks is all you know, they, they check all the boxes, and uh, he or she could be incredibly charismatic, um, almost uh, to a degree. Uh, you know, it's like a, a seductive, right? Uh, mm -hmm. to, to actually work with that person and. Uh, but if your gut tells you that there's something there, I, it's it's always good to just uh, sleep on it and and ponder and reflect. For me, 
it's so interesting. Sometimes I will go to bed with a few questions and I, and I kind of do these like night affirmations asking for an answer when I go to bed and then I wake up sometimes and I have the answer. It's kind of interesting. Well, that, that is something also that I've learned. I mean, I, I, it definitely has happened. I mean, for any important decision, I always sleep on it. I mean, um, 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 I think that the subconscious is working when you're asleep and problems that you have to resolve and things that you have to decide help you out having a good night's sleep. And, uh, and, and I think that's extremely important uh, and on, on big decisions. Uh, I think you avoid making those uh, hot decisions because you're emotionally charged and uh, to make a, and, and, and sleeping over it uh, is one of the most important recommendations I would give every, anybody. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I have only learned that by making a lot of impulsive, <laughs> incorrect decisions and then, you know, provide. Well, just, I, I, uh, yeah. I, think, I, I take life, you know, like a laboratory, right? You're, you're testing stuff all the time. I'm, I, I'm, I don't believe in the word failure in a sense. You're just like, you have a hypothesis, you test it out and, and you see how it goes out. Right. And, and, and the more you can do, the more you learn in a sense. Of course, you can read books and you can have learning from experiences from 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 other people in the store, and, and that's very useful as well. But that iteration process is 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 critical uh, for yourself as well, and 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 trying to learn and, and trying to have these pattern recognition afterwards after having done many of these that that are crucial and not feeling bad for that, right? Just just keep on going, you know. Yes, well, that's the best definition. Why you know you have we all have this uh, Silicon Valley ethos of accepting failure. You know, failing sucks, but it's so much more about how you respond towards doing enough tests with enough determination so you get it right at some point. Yeah, um, because it's not pleasant uh, to make mistakes, but you you must you know pick yourself up again and 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 continue. Um, so. You know, you, there was, and then you were at this company, right? So going back to your story, so the yeah. Harvard Brown folks and so forth, and you've got the company raised a little bit of money. They, you joined as the, as, as the product person. Yeah. So, so in that business is like at mid 1999 and uh, I drop out of school and, and I start working uh, with these guys. There were two, so we're three and this investor was like half a million dollars. And they start brainstorming like what business and i was like marketplace i mean it's no brainer right and and at that time a, a whole bunch of marketplaces like pop up you know actually at that time around there mercado libre is launched by marco halperin the uh, remate also from ale cox and for and like a hundred more uh, marketplaces were launched uh, uh, around that time so by the time they were discussing this Everybody's like, no, but already everybody's doing that. You know, it's like, we got to figure something out. So something different. And, and they came down with the idea of doing uh, a marketplace, but for Latin American art, which I thought it was like too niche. I mean, for the, for that, for, for, I mean, it's like over 20 years ago. Uh, I, I don't think today you have the market it, I, for that. It continues, it continues to be very niche if I've gotten that now over email. I'd be like, oof. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the company was called Turas. And, uh, and that business lasted like for six months. At the end, uh, you know, uh, we had hired like, I don't know, 15 people in total. Um, there was, actually, the CFO today of Mercado Libre used to work there. Uh, he was he, Pedro Arndt, uh, and 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 the team I remember that time was fantastic. I mean, all the people there went out to do uh, very very accomplishing things in 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 Argentina and elsewhere. But but Pedro was super smart. Uh, I remember he, uh, back then, and uh, he was more in charge of doing the business model at that time. Uh, he was doing the whole presentation and everything. Like before, you had to do a business plan. Remember, like twenty years ago, there were the today you have like ten slides. You know, it's ridiculous in a sense, right? But before it was like you actually had to work and do a deck, like a hundred pages of your business model. And he was in charge of doing that in the business. 
And uh, so he eventually went to Mercado Libre and this business uh, closed up by the end of 1999. I actually left like a month before. I, I just sensed like this is going nowhere. Uh, and um, but but the good thing is that uh, what was interesting is that in one moment, as 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 um, as the person in charge of product, I had to hire designers, right? So um, I, I remember I interviewed forty graphic designers, and nobody had a clue about like a website design. Everybody was doing Flash at that. I remember at that at, at that time, Flash. I don't know if if you were there. And, I, I uh, have I have done a lot of uh, rendering and exporters uh, in in Flash. My first job with the internet has already been um, automated by algorithms. I guess this is how old uh, we are. But yeah, I used to uh, render um, uh, art uh, and upload uh, Java uh, JavaScript code on, into ad servers, and we would have to learn a little bit of Flash through that, so we could program you know banner ads. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it was it, Promomi was used a lot for banners and things. But the problem with Flash was that it was heavy, and it, and 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 it wasn't very intuitive when you entered a website. And it was all Flash. It was like what you had to learn every single website. You have to learn like, okay, where do I go? You know. So uh, I was more into making very basic, very minimalistic designs uh, with with very lightweight. Uh, websites and things of the sort. So eventually, we found one person that 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 was that had very very was very minimalistic in the design and things of the sort. Uh, uh, which, at the end of that year, actually became my girlfriend. So I worked like for for six months beside her, and 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 that person actually became my wife, which is today my wife <laughs> still. <love> <laughs> Uh, so, so I got I got something very important from 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 that initial startup. But from then on, I never worked in any other anybody else's company. It was always something that I started. I see. Did you have this like indomitable like desire to do things a certain way and little patience to potentially negotiate with other people because you had maybe some more experienced than them and you knew that that was the best way or, or ultimately like what led you to say, look, like I'm going to be a full-time entrepreneur. And I, I, for me, at least there was a very clear moment where I, uh, I realized that. I, I think the moment was that by understanding how a startup was from the inside and how the decisions were being made and things like that, I said, I actually could do this. I, I, I felt I had, I, I would have never thought beforehand that I could start from zero and build something. But having been in that six month process and realizing how decisions were made and, and, and understanding what the, the, the issues were and things. So I said, you know, it doesn't seem like brain surgery. I think, I, I think I could pull this off. So it was more about gaining some confidence in myself and realizing that I could pull it off. And, and since I had been online since 1994, it was already six years in the internet. I had, I had done websites. I understood. I realized by interviewing a lot of people, the amount of ignorance there was on, uh, on the internet back then. I mean, re people really didn't understand much and investors even less. So I would see entrepreneurs being funded by, by people that were coming in from MBAs. And and, uh, and and just because of the title that they had, they would get money. They, they would receive money, but they really didn't understand uh, how to generate traffic, uh, how to design the, the the websites, which which was not trivial back then. Even the back end. I mean, before you had Amazon Web Services, you got You had to know how to uh, uh, have servers, how how to scale them, and 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 things of the sort. And Back in the day, you had to have a database that would probably cost you like a million bucks. If you wanted to have Oracle, uh, you would have to spend an insane amount of capital for for databases back then. Today, you know, you use MySQL and you put it in 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 in, in Pohres or things of sort, and you put it in AWS and, and it's done. It's, it's it's completely trivial today, but it wasn't back then. And so I realized I could I could pull it off, and I also saw how they would pitch to investors. And I was in those meetings and, and I would understand that investors most didn't have a clue. They were just like, okay, the internet 
it's something important's going to scale. Okay, I want to be there, but I mean, it was like throwing money at uh, people I had no clue. I knew them. I mean, they everyone everybody was trying to figure it out, right? And uh, yeah, I I think I mean what that the that quote is so important because I think that it, you know it's that moment where you have self confidence that you understand that you know at the at the other side. You have another person that's also trying to figure it out and hopefully doing their best. Um, you know, my my first month in in venture capital, so I worked very hard to get the job at a Founders Club at FCVC uh, with no credentials, right? Like I, you know, technically I beat the kids from Harvard and Stanford, and, and then when I was there for a month, I was I was just like, all right, I gotta win. I am going to fucking destroy. I'm going to crush it. And I would arrive before everyone else would be the last person to leave. And every weekend I, I was there studying, studying. And then it got to a point where you start doing deals and you source companies and and you realize it's like, oh, there are so many people in this market that, I mean, they just don't know what they're doing. Or from the outside, it looks like these investors are geniuses and they're like brilliant people. But at the end, there's just a lot of uh, smoke. It's mm-hmm. insane. Yeah, and then and that's what gave me the self confidence to say, look, with enough luck and determination, I can actually be good at this. Um, and and I, I would add in something that you said is that not only was that growth and self confidence for this, but also was so hungry of proving that the decision of dropping out was worth it that I worked my ass off for years and years. Uh, so even when I, when, I, when I went into this company in the mid of 1999, I remember I would go walking from my home to the bus stop for 30 minutes. I would take a bus for 10 minutes, then a train for another 40 minutes, and I would go get the subway for five minutes. And that's how I started my day. And I would go like eight, 8.30 a.m. And I would be the last guy out of the office. And uh, and I, I my, my my work ethic at, at that time was like, okay, this is this has to work, you know? So when it didn't work the next six months, I was like, shit, you know, I, I, I dropped out of school. Uh, this didn't work. You know, it's th- that mindset that, okay, my, maybe my parents were right. I shouldn't have done this, you know? And, 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 and instead of uh, accepting that, I doubled down. I said, you know what? I'll start now my business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. But I think, I mean, you're you, wrong, you know? <laughs> this is not, but, but I think it's great. I, you know, in, in, in a few different uh, ways. And the first one is just this ability of understanding that it's very like, the earth, I mean, people have better skills than others, but ultimately, like, life is an equal playing field for the most part. And when you realize that, you know, there, you know, the deltas between people aren't that significant, if you're playing at a, you know, maybe if you're like Michael Phelps inside a pool, right? And then you got to train a ton, right? You're not yeah. going to try to, I don't know, be a swimmer, a professional swimmer, and try to, you know, I don't know, pilot a plane. It would be a little tough, but. If you're yeah. at the right environment, meaning working, that's, that, that's, I think, number one. The second thing that, that, that you've mentioned that I think it's so important is the skin in the game with alignment of interest, which is basically you burned the, the, the entire island and you set sail on the boat, not looking yeah. back. And it doesn't matter where you're going to stop, you'll keep on going. Um, yeah. and, um, forcing yourself at, to be in that position at the reputational level, both tangible and intangible is a mm-hmm. super powerful driving force, right? Mm-hmm. No, definitely. And and I think mm-hmm. it is, it's also, you know, they're, they're stepping tones, to, uh, stepping uh, uh, moments where it's building that self-confidence also, right? I mean, I, now, now that I recall, I mean, going back, you know, I, I really never talk about these issues. So something that came up right now is that um, in the first year I was at the university, um, I, I, I did a program called Junior Achievement. And there, there was this a business simulation that you would do online. Um, and uh, you would have to decide. And it was a simulation and you had to have a team and you would compete first in Argentina and then it would be a global competition and things of sort. And I thought it was like, it was kind of like a game. You know, I used to play a lot of uh, 
uh, strategy games. I used to play SimCity, Age of Empires, and things of the sort, and I would play like for hours. You know, I I could be in Civilization, yeah, for ten hours and, and just like like that. You know, mm-hmm. and I just love those games. And so this game was about you had to define like five things: the, the price of your product, how much investment you would do in the product, um, how much marketing, how much uh, research you would spend on. And things of the sort. But bottom line, what happened is that this competition, it would work for eight weeks. You would have to make a decision on pricing in, in every single week and you would compete with other eight teams. And, uh, and, and I won in Argentina. I became the, the, the company that, that beat everybody else. And with that, uh, I competed with 500 teams around the world. And the final was in Japan with eight teams. And, uh, and, and I actually, and I actually won that, 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 uh, that, that, that championship in a sense from, it was junior achievement and, and Harvard association that had built this. And, and that really gave me like, wow, I can actually compete at a global level. And be, be, before that, I was always like, my sisters were always very disciplined on everything that they, they were always like the best students. I was never the best student. I was like good at the stuff that I liked and just like average on the things that I, I didn't like. I, I would just like pass, you know, and, uh, uh, but the things I really liked, I, I could, I would go full blown. My sisters would get like everything awesome, you know, and I was like, fuck, you know, I can't do that. I don't know. I, I don't have the discipline to do that. But when I realized that I could actually compete uh, at, at not only like my local level, that gave me another sense of, Maybe I I think that gave me the the chance of actually dropping out of school of saying, you know, maybe uh, this is a way I can I I can prove also that I can compete in a sense uh, with uh, other level uh, people. So uh, I don't know. That just came up to mind right now. Uh, It's 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 been a long time. (laughs) But these these moments are very important. It's like I think that's you when you realize the type of results you can get in life when you really throw yourself with your mind and soul into a project to its fullest extension and you give it all. Uh, and then when it comes back with, a, it's, it's a very good reinforcement mechanism. Um, I, I, you know, I, I had to even control myself. Like I, I've been to the hospital twice, like for like panic attacks because I was just so addicted to that feeling of like, you know, now I, I'm, I live a far more balanced life thanks to, you know, meditation and yoga. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but, but it's interesting. So, um, and then, you know, so then you had, uh, after that, is that when you did Tarjetas Telefonicas? No. So actually the, the first business I started there in, in 2000, uh, early 2000 was, um, so I was tracking the market. 20 bill. years ago. That's crazy. Yeah. It's so just go was, by so fast. I was still tracking the, the, the market and there was a company called mp3.com that had IPO'd in the NASDAQ and it was worth Eight billion dollars, and 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 my thesis was, why don't we do this, but for Latin America? It's like you have like seven seven percent of GDP of the world is here. So look, we we at least a five hundred million dollar opportunity, right? Uh, you have uh, here in your in 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 in, in, in our doorsteps. So and and I thought it was a really good solution for independent bands. Uh, so you know it's. People could promote their music through a website, and these bands would yeah, actually you Spotify like ten years earlier, basically. Yeah, but it, it's more like then MySpace actually it, it, I actually pursued this this route. But in in the year two thousand, internet penetration in Latin America was one percent, one and a half percent. There wasn't AdSense, there wasn't anything, but we reached like 25,000 bands at, at that time. And well, I, I remember after the BBS times when you still could, you know, you'd have to like go online later in the evening so you would save some money. And, uh, you, you know, I remember using uh, Netscape <laughs> and uh, you and you kind of you ran out of stuff to do. <laughs> on the internet which is the opposite of today like maybe you check your email you read some news and you play a little silly game and it all felt so different but then you know you would right like you would run out of stuff to do on the internet which is insane to think about today. yeah definitely i mean i, I used to connect with bbs in, in argentina 
but that was probably earlier. And then 2000, I think there, I had cable and there was a little bit more stuff. AOL was the, the, the king at that time still, which was kind of crazy as a closed loop. Uh, business, but but look, we launched this business and and we raised three hundred thousand dollars. We raised it basically going to one lawyer that was investing a lot in different internet companies and and, and two other and one of them was the previous investor from the other company. And uh, do you remember the terms? What I do remember and one huge mistake I did is one of the investors, which was the CEO of the previous company of Turas, he said, give me 25% and I'll, and I'll, and, and I'll help you raise capital and, and I'll just give you advice. And, uh, <laughs> that was the worst. <laughs> it was like, it was like free equity for, for nothing in return, basically. And, uh, uh I, I I I did the same fuck up for my first company. I raised fifty thousand dollars for thirty percent of the company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, looking at back, I mean, there was there was nothing you could like read that anybody could recommend anything to you. You know, like today people talk about entrepreneurship, entrepreneur. You know, like there's, there's so much uh, best practices and things of sort. Twenty years ago, it's like everybody's figuring yeah. it out, right? Oh, it's a massive signal as well, depending on like, if I'm looking at a company and they have these weird asshole or a massive cap table issue, I, it, the, the problem sometimes isn't, it's not even the problem is the fact that that individual got he himself or herself in that problem in the first place. Yeah. It means that that entrepreneur is not curious enough because there's just so much information out there. So there yeah. are, it's, it's interesting also, right? With more information, it requires a higher level of critical thinking from founders and, and investors. And then, you know, there are certain things that you really can't make those mistakes, at least if you want to, you know, partner with, with, with very good people. But back in the day, <laughs> and back very, in the day and I, think, I think we all made these mistakes, like the advisory, like uh, hoping that they're going to help you out. Then if you bring in somebody and you don't give them, um, uh, you just give them stock, but there's no vesting period. You know, that's the typical also mistake, uh, at least that, that, that I did also initially. But uh, so that business, like in a year and a half, I mean, it, it went to zero. So in the sense that I ran out of capital, I actually started launching some other sites that would generate uh, traffic. It was a humor site called Rejunte. Uh, that w was, it had funny videos and, and, and images that were funny and people would share them and things of sort. But a, a year and a half later, I just ran out of money. I had 35 employees and I had to fire everybody, right? So, uh, so imagine this, right? So I dropped out. I went to the first business six months. Uh, that failed. Then I started this business. A year and a half later, I like put everything to it. And, and uh, having to fire people that you promised, you know, and think it was like, it was the worst, you know, it was like two years of like, it, it was, it was harsh. And the other thing was that as an economist, I knew that Argentina was, was in serious problems. I mean, uh, I don't know how much you know of Argentina, but in 2001, we had a mega, mega crisis. Um, Oh no! I, I yes, I, I, Argentina. I mean, lap time as a whole, but Argentina is a case of it. I mean, each country. I think you, you know. I mean, if you look at Venezuela, and it's. I mean, it's tough. Uh, there are so many interesting opportunities there, and you know, we both invest in the region and build businesses in the region and so forth. But if the progress with the internet depended on politicians, Jesus, we would be fucked. Look, I remember in school when my dad would give me my lunch money, I would actually buy lunch in the morning because it was going to be cheaper than doing it at, at noon. I was in the middle of hyperinflation. So it was better. Wow. It was better to buy my food in the morning than to buy it in, at noon because prices changed wow. that quickly. Uh, wow. So it was like a, I, I would save money if I, I, I bought everything earlier. And uh, sometimes I wouldn't buy more for during the rest of the week because... Uh, the, the, the hyperinflation is crazy. I mean, it's something, it's a daily changes in price. And, uh, and you know, entrepreneurship is, is, is hard.
building a company is hard. But when you ha- actually have currency issues, tax, I'm like, the whole thing is quicksand. So I think entrepreneurs that, that, that have built stuff in Argentina have had, uh, like in expert mode, you know, and, and, and so the, the, the need of a, a adaptation and, and, and extreme situations prepares you to a certain extent to, to really hard uh, circumstances. I think it's good in a sense of, of, of practicing and uh, just uh, and, and then competing in other markets. But sometimes when it's only about solving like stupid stuff that should already be resolved with time, it's, it's also uh, bad uh, because you don't dedicate so much time to, to, to company building. You're more about just surviving, you know, uh, things that are completely trivial in, in other countries. Yes, but with this resiliency, the Ghana, right? Like for me, uh, if I had a cyborg, a founder, you would have the self-esteem and the suspended disbelief of an of an Argentinian, uh, having gone to the Israeli army, uh, mm-hmm. partying in Brazil, educated in the U.S. That's like the best <laughs> cyborg. <laughs> oh man, survival survival in Argentina is a big issue, man. I mean, and you just got to figure it out. Yes. Um, and then, um, so, and you, and you, and then, you know, you were, when was uh, 2002? So like you, you still, you know, you're not giving up. You're like, I'm not getting a job. Right. I, I have this, this, this saying that's like, if everything went wrong in my life, I'd be helping sell more deodorant at like Unilever or something like that. Yeah. So 2000, uh, so I started in early 2000, this business a year in, you know, you had early 2000 and NASDAQ crashes, right? So the, the market uh, goes to crap, basically. And by the end of the year, I was like, wow, I have this business really hard to monetize. The market is still not there. Big believer in the Internet, but, you know, very small penetration still in Argentina and the rest of Latin America. So I start thinking, OK, if this business doesn't go out and the economy in Argentina is going to tank. And and I failed with this other business, with my business and, and, and things. So it's like. I want to run from here. And I said, uh, you know what? Maybe I should go back and hit the books. Uh, maybe after these two, it's a signal that, that I should go back and, and, and study. And, uh, and once this business goes, um, out of business, I have to fire all these people and things of the sort. I asked my dad, you know, uh, you know, I failed. You know, I, I, I just can't manage this. Uh, but I want to finish school. Would you pay for my school if I go to a top 10 business school in, 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 in the U.S.? And, and, and he comes back and he says, yes, if you enter in top 10, I'll pay it, but you have to pay everything else. So he said, look, I'll pay for tuition, but you got to pay everything else. I said, okay, done. So I apply and, and my girlfriend back then, my wife today, she said, and we were just going out for a year, uh, a year's time, right? And I asked her, would you accompany me to the US if I were to study? And back then she's like, yeah, yeah, I'll, we'll go, right? I'll go. So, but she said, it can't be anywhere cold. So, yeah, so no when, San I Francisco. See, when I see the top 10 business schools, it's no like Boston. Harvard, Warden, I mean, no everything was in cold places except for USC, University of Southern California. So yes. I actually apply only to USC and uh, I, I do my SATs. I, I, I do pretty well on, 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 on those things. And, and I get, uh, I get into USC, right? Uh, so I remember this being like May, I think of 2001. And I tell my girlfriend, Hey, look, I'm in, I'm in, in, in sunny California in, in, in LA. So you're coming, right? <laughs> and and she was and and she told me years later, like she had said yes, yes, but because it just seemed like far off, right? I mean, uh, making the decision of going to another country, not being married, and everything was like it was crazy in a sense. And um, so so I make the decision to go, and she 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 at the end says, yes, I'm going, but she was working. She was a graphic designer in a very uh, successful business in, in Argentina called Exacta uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, so I go to, 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 to Los Angeles uh, and, and, and she follows suit. 
And I remember for a month, uh, we lived in, in a hotel called Vagabond Inn. <laughs> and, and it was for, because I had to pay. <laughs> I had to pay for everything else, so uh, so I could go to USC. They're like, I'm st- <laughs> I love the name, though. <laughs> but it was called back pond in. It was still like two blocks away from USC, but we stayed there for a month. And uh, my girlfriend didn't speak much English at that time, and uh, but but uh, we we eventually started doing. It, very early on, we started doing design and, and websites for other, for, for third, for other companies, right? So we started making money, but at that time, nobody knew how to do websites and things that sort of, I mean, today you just click a couple of buttons and, and, and you have a website, right? Or a blog or things that sort of back then you had to like build the whole thing. So we would sell them for a couple of grand uh, each. And that's how we, we, we started making money. But basically my decision was, you know what? I'm going to go. With both feet, and I'm gonna like finish school. I'm gonna get awesome grades. So I did the first semester. I got all A's, and I said, "This is boring, like crazy." I mean, it's it's. I had been uh, studied economics in Argentina, which was very math oriented. I had run my startup of working 14, 16 hours a day, and and school was easy. I mean, I, it was not intense at all. Uh, I, I could I could cram all my subjects in like two three days, and that's what I did. I would go from nine a.m. to five p.m. for three days, and then I would like have four days of free time. So once I finished my first semester, I said I got to figure out something else to do. I I got to finish school, but I got I got to figure out what else to do. So my girlfriend goes back to Argentina uh, to finish off some stuff. And she calls me one day, collect from Buenos Aires, and it cost me four dollars a minute, and I, and, it, and it's and and it's thirty minute call, uh, over a hundred bucks a call, and like she she likes to talk, so I said I I cut the when the bill comes and like, shit, where I, I find a new girlfriend or a way to actually make these calls uh, <laughs> cheaper, <laughs> right? <laughs> 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 It couldn't work, right? So what was really interesting is that with a sense of trying to figure out how to solve this issue, I actually found that there were these calling cards in the market that it would cost like one cent a minute or two cents to call to Buenos Aires. And it's like, how is this possible? And 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 I would go and 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 try to figure it out. And then I bought a few. And then I, I, I went to the back part. I, I went to the sites that were offering this and more than the sites, the companies. And I realized everybody was doing voice over IP. And, and so it was the initial part of, of PBX boxes connecting to internet with oh, local. I, remember. I worked for a company called Nimbus. Uh, we, I mean, we had a, uh, 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 I think, I think we bought some media at uh, Sonico at some point. Yeah, I, I remember uh, Nimbus. Uh, I, I do yes. remember Nimbus. So, so basically, what 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 I what I did was okay. I, I found this product. I said I cannot believe how much cheaper it is, and I started to look online if there were companies that were selling this. I couldn't find anything, and I said, "Wow, we could actually sell these calling cards online," and uh, and just the price elasticity there is just enormous. It's like four bucks or one cent. It was like a no brainer. And I thought like a lot of people didn't, didn't know that this could be done. And uh, so what I did, I investigated for like two, three months. I, 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 I really checked, like did a whole bunch of research. And, um, and I, had, I had met some Ukraine programmer in Argentina in one of my, my girlfriend's um, uh, company. And he, these guy, this guy connected me to two Ukraine programmers in Ukraine and uh, these guys would charge like $250 a month for, for programming. And I said, wow, jackpot. I mean, I have no money. I mean, these guys are cheap. I mean, no brainer to, to build stuff with these guys. Uh, but the problem was that they were in Ukraine. I was in Los Angeles. So it's like at 12 at night, they would like wake up. And uh, so I started doing a website with them my my girlfriend was the graphic designer and i had like 500 bucks 
and uh, to buy calling cards in 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 you know Seven Eleven or things of the sort. And I would come back to to my home, scratch all the calling cards, uh, and and then put the pin number and access number in a database, and uh, and 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 then put that online and see if anybody would come and and buy these things, right? So. So what was interesting was that we launched this site like mid 2002 and, um, and, and like the first day we like sold like two calling cards. Wow. You know, we, we started doing, you know, promotion SEO more than anything else. AdWords, I don't think was still in the realm. So I think we were using Overture uh, at, oh, yeah. at that time, which was then. Yeah, it was bought by Yahoo and then they integrated it, but they made a mess there. So uh, Google eventually like really took off dramatically with that. But it initially it was yeah, with Oprah. They did better with the double click acquisition. Yeah. 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 It was fantastic. So, um, so first day, like two calling cards, fifth day, we we're selling $500 of, of, of calling cards, like crazy. I said, like, Bingo, man. I mean, we made it. You know, it's like there's a, there's a, I didn't even know the word product market fit, but we had product market fit uh, at that moment. But uh, what I realized though is that suddenly, because I was approving all the transactions, you know, we had a, a very basic backend. I would be the guy responding emails and, 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 and everything when people wanted to buy something of a sort. But then I realized that there was one person buying everything. And, um, I, I had like, I don't know, we sold like a thousand bucks in five days, but like 700 or 800 was just one guy. And I said, mm, th this looks fishy, you know? So, um, and then and then I realized that this guy was using a whole bunch of different credit cards, not, not even one credit card. He was using a whole bunch of different credit cards. And I said, shit, th th this might be fraud. But, and, and I was like, but how can this be fraud if like the credit card company is actually accepting this transaction? They're, they're, they're accepting the, the number, the, the CVC code and, and things of the sort, but still it, it went through, right? So at the end of the, I, 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 I completely shut down the site. And a couple of weeks later, start getting chargebacks on all those transactions. So it's like I lost a uh, 700 bucks plus $25 per transaction because that was the chargeback cost of, of, of doing this. So it was like down like 2000 bucks. Uh, on, on, on that thing. And the other thing is that I didn't even have any margin on the calling cards. I had like, um. Oh, you were charging costs or just no, like basically? I would go to 7 Eleven, buy face value 10 bucks of one calling yeah. card, and I would get zero margin. I, w I was just testing if people would buy it. So I would make oh, no money. This was the test. Gotcha. With no yeah. margin. This was the test. So basically, what happened is that once, once, the chargeback started to happen, I started actually approving one by one every single transaction and try to figure out what algorithms we could build so these things wouldn't happen. So then if a person would come, I wouldn't allow multiple credit cards. I wouldn't allow uh, uh, X amount of transactions in a, in a certain day or a certain week. Then uh, we, we started testing like where these transactions coming from, if they were connected through proxies or directly from from home. So, I mean, from there, I, I tried to just figure out how, how to solve this. And and basically, it's a business that in, in three years, I worked absolutely every single day, weekends, nights. I would start working at 12 and finish working at 5 a.m. with the Ukraine programmers. And it, it became a business that that came to be almost $10 million in revenue, very profitable. And, and then I was able to finish school. So I was like, you know, I did it. You know, I, I finished school. Here's the, the title for my mom. And uh, because that was, <laughs> that was the, the biggest incentive I've had. But I kind of like, um, you know, I was able to build a business, a very uh, or organically grown. I, I had put like $10,000 into the business and grew it completely organically. And uh, so at that time, I was working completely remote. I was working from home, from classes. I would go to class. And if it got boring, I started working. And I had a, a, a laptop back then. And I had a team of customer support in Argentina and these guys from Ukraine in, in, in Ukraine. And that's how I built this business up to like 2005 or so. 
Awesome. And then um, it's interesting also that even before Sonico, you still launched like three other companies, right? There was Cumple Alerta, Tu Vostal, Flodeo. Yeah. Urex yeah. is a machine. <laughs> <laughs> it's an iteration machine. But be, what's very interesting about these businesses is actually I built them in between 2002 and 2006 because it was a complement to Tarjetas Telefonicas. And, and how is that? When we were purchasing, uh, when we were doing marketing for the calling car business, we realized that it worked extremely well when we promoted it on e-cards sites. Because mostly an e-card site, you would be sending a greeting card to a friend, a family member, and... Uh, and then you would, say, hey, call me as well, right? Like, here's yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, so if you're sending e-card, why don't you call me, right? So that's kind of what we we realized that that was working extremely well. And then we said, you know, instead of spending that marketing dollars in these in, in these companies, why don't we build an e-card site? And and we built two of the largest e-card sites at that time, which became Tu Postal and Tarjeta Buba uh, for Latin America. And they they got to have like 25 million e-cards sent in Christmas and New Year. It was insane. I mean, the, the volume that we generated with, with those uh, two sites. And it became a, an incredible business where the e-card site would generate traffic to uh, traffic and e-commerce business to the calling card business. And also we would do advertising because at the end, AdSense came up in about, not early, but later. And we would do like a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a month of advertising revenue. And I had an extremely profitable business uh, that was generating e-commerce sales at the same time. And then this other business called Cumple Alerta, which is very similar to what Facebook is today, right? It's a, it's a system that alerts somebody's birthday nowadays. I mean, it, it's not much more than that. So it's, it was. I, yeah. I miss a feature on that that I used to use all the time for e-cards. I would love to have it back. So if you have a product, now I'm being very self-serving in, you know, during the podcast, but this is something I do, used to do a lot. So Facebook, um, at some point, I don't use Facebook anymore. It's only for birthday reminders, but then, you know, integrate that with calendar. Someone should just do a high quality birthday app that is mobile first. And then, um, I, I used to buy coffees for people that I liked on their birthdays. Cause you know, like I think you and I, we live pretty global lives and we have friends all over the world. And then, uh, it's a good idea actually. It, you know? It's, it's a very simple fi- feature, very simple, valuable. Uh-huh. Easy. That would be like amazing cash car. If anyone wants to do that, like I'd love it as just as a user, uh, you know, because, and then it, it's literally, I would buy them $5, a $5 gift card from Starbucks, but no one does that. Right. Like everyone just like, they'll do the, like, because people stop calling now. Right. They don't call. They don't do like they just send you a WhatsApp, which is bullshit, you know. Um, so and then I, I would like look at like, OK, maybe there are four birthdays today. So every day I'd spend like five, ten dollars. But people remember, it's like, oh, you're the only guy that sent me a cappuccino. Uh, and uh, that was immensely helpful just to, uh, you know, spread love. And um, people just remember that, you know, you care a little bit more than others. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, I miss it. And then, you know, the Starbucks, like that digital wallet gift thing that they had, they, they, they killed it. I don't know why. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's, it's, it's good to think about it. I mean, if you imagine Cumple Alerta got to the high point of 21 million registered users and 180 million alerts. So every single day we would send uh, a few hundred thousands of, of, of emails, maybe even a million in, in, in a day. And you would receive an email of your friend's birthday and it will tell you, hey, why don't you call him or why don't you send him an e-card? And so these businesses in itself, uh, um, like they, they pushed each other, you know, they leveraged each other and it, and it became a very uh, profitable business. Uh, again, completely uh, bootstrapped, right? And uh, and 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 the and, uh, and and that basically takes me to like 2006, when when I go to my sister's university. She, with 18, she went to study at Stanford biology, and um, I, I go to meet with her, and uh, and I was just curious. So, what are you using? What 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 sites and things are so? And she she said, look, there's this Facebook thing, you know. And I said, oh, let me see. Let me check it out. 
and but only people from Stanford can use it, she says. Oh, wow. Let, 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 let me get a glimpse of it. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic because it had first and last name, photo profile, and you would share photos. And that was extremely unique. At, before then, everybody had like fake uh, names and nobody would put their photo profile. It was about anonymity. You know? Yeah, well, the, 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 the group chats that you would log on on portals, right? With, yeah. And just shout with complete strangers. And we all had these like hidden wow, weird the Lurk. nicknames. Remember Lurk? Like, dude, what yeah. the fuck? Wait, 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 wait. Like, man, that's so funny, man. I can't, I, I had forgot, <laughs> I had forgotten about that completely. You know what? Merc was one of my first distribution platforms. I would just spam like my sites <laughs> in those channels. <laughs> I would go into channels. I would start chatting and then look, enter my site, enter my like, something like that. Wow. Yeah. That was no, and people would do it. It would work tremendously. I mean, there was this hidden trust, almost as if like we were all neighbors, right? Yeah. Because there were so there weren't that many people online, so you was like, oh, probably if you're online, you know, maybe you're you, you are a nice person. So like, you know, do you want to chat? It's this a pre-camera chat roulette. That's what it was. Yeah. Well, there were these <laughs> Yahoo groups back in the day. Remember? And, oh and now, yeah, I remember. Yeah. And now this reminds me also when I started the the calling card business. I would go to Yahoo groups of people living in Los Angeles from like Argentina or Spain. And I would start a conversation and say, look, I found this site where you can buy calling cards. <laughs> so, so I would use them to distribute, you know, my, my, my business. I mean, it was, it, it was for free and it was useful in, in a sense for those people. Uh, but wow, I, I forgot about that. But yeah, that's great. Um, so basically, mm, I see nice. this uh, from my sister, and uh, and I said, "Wow, this yes. is fantastic!" And MySpace um, was the the king at that time, and Murdoch, you know, buys it for like five hundred fifty million dollars. And I said, "You know, there's something here." And I realized, look, with the calling card business, the e card site, and the cumple alerta, I actually have. Uh, a massive social network, I asked, uh, a social graph, you know, with the, with the birthday alarm system, I actually had 21 million registered users with their actual social graph, the people that they cared about. So I said, maybe with this, I could actually kickstart a social network in Latin America with all the, the, the users I have, but with the idea of not doing MySpace, but with the idea of getting people to put their first and last name and real photo profiles and use it to share photos. And why was sharing photos so important? Because back in the day, Hotmail would have two megabytes of space. And when I was living in Los Angeles, my mom would send me one photo and my email would collapse. So I really saw that the value add of Facebook was just being able to share photos between people that you cared about. Uh, among anything else, and then being able to find people with first and last name. And that was something extremely unique. And we actually launched uh, Sonico uh, in in mid-2007, uh, which uh, we basically um, launched it. And uh, yeah, it was probably like in June of 2007. And like in six months, we had 10 million users. Amazing. And uh, we were able to scale it dramatically. And at that time, we had Sonico, we had the calling card business, the cumple alerta, the e-cards. We were doing over $10 million in, 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 in revenues and, and, and very profitable business. And I remember I went out and I, I, I went to talk with Marco Halperin from Mercado Libre and and then also uh, Ale Coxen for from the Remate, and I told him that I wanted to raise capital. You know, back in that day in 2007, again it was not very common to raise capital. Uh, and uh, I said, yeah, he I raised just, a lot for that time. It was 4.3 million, which that, at that time, yeah. But that was my my initial was I'll just raise a million bucks, and uh, and Alex says like I think you should raise more. 
Uh, but I said, look, I just want 10%, $1 million, $10 million post, 1x revenue. You know, it's like, uh, and so I start getting in and understanding this game in a sense. Uh, so he said, look, you should raise more. And, he, and, I, and I tell him, look, if I raise more, it should, it should be from a VC that understands product. And, and I told him, look, if you can put me in contact with Funders Fund, maybe I, I maybe I, I go through there. And he tells me, okay, I'll put you in contact with Peter Thiel and Sean Parker from over there. And uh, I remember that the 5th of December of 2007, I go with a whole management team and, uh, and uh, we present. Sean Parker's there. He was the president of Facebook at that time. And we were sh- showing our growth curves like insane. I mean, the, we, I remember one day having 250,000 new customers in a single day. And at that time, it was just enormous. And... Uh, yes. I had a, I had a Sonico profile. I don't remember. You you had a Sonico profile. I did. And uh, and and at the next day, I we we they ex- they they said, okay, done. You have six million dollars at eighteen million dollar pre. Now I was fascinated by 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 that at that moment. I just couldn't believe it. And but the issue was. That the company that we had built with the calling card business, the, the e-card side and everything, it was a structure where it was very efficient tax-wise. So it, it, it wasn't the typical Delaware type company. It was more like BVI with Panama uh, uh, stock. And they said, you know, you got to redo this whole thing. And, uh, and I basically had, had problems in, 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 in getting and well, building, you know, the Delaware uh, company is just like three days. But then when I wanted to uh, uh, change it, so Delaware was owned. So the Argentine company was owned by Delaware. Was a whole subsidiary, yep. Uh, the problem was that there was a strike in the in the government in, in Argentina, and I couldn't do that formally. So what happened was that for three months, there was a strike going on in Argentina and I couldn't get this formalized. And in the meantime, I had gotten some other angel investors to invest and some other VCs. But it comes to a moment where Founders Fund and everything, they say, okay, you have a done deal. Okay, so everybody starts sending their money and uh, and suddenly... Like there's like radio silence f- from from funders fund. It's like what's going on? I mean, we're we're receiving money and uh, but we're not getting any notice from 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 these guys. So um, so I give them a call and say, what's going on? Maybe you should come here. I fly to San Francisco from Buenos Aires with my brother, the CTO uh, of the company. And so so they pick up the phone, but they don't tell you like what's going to say fly here and let's talk in person that was there yeah answer. yeah and uh, because there was just not 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 answering back in a sense right so we go over there and uh, and at that time it was a very particular time in in Argentina as well in 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 early 2008 where um they had launched a law called 147 which was basically charging uh, taxes for exporting agricultural products. And in, at that time, Argentina was appearing in CNN with people stealing meat in, in, in the streets. And they had done this tax of, if you want to export, we'll charge you a, 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 a tax, right? So when I go to the office in, in, in Founders Fund, they said, look, this is our first invest, this would be our first investment Outside of the U.S., we've seen Argentina in CNN with all these with all these troubles, and now they're going to be charging taxes to export. Just makes no sense. I'm sorry, but we cannot do this investment uh, with you guys. We don't know what's what's going on in Argentina. We've never been to Argentina, and I remember that Peter Thiel at that time they had this hedge fund, the the Claridge Fund or something uh, of the sort. And they were betting against Argentina as well. So, um, and, and, and that's how I 
I, I had that problem with the Founders Fund. But since the business was just skyrocketing, I was able to close all the rest of the investors. Some put more money and I actually closed 4.7 million uh, in early 2008. Great. Interesting. Do you guys still keep in touch? Now they are, you know, alongside SoftBank, one of the anchors here in Miami. <laughs> And the honest truth is no. <laughs> okay. Now that's fine. I mean, I think that that is such a painful situation for, for, for a founder. And I think it can go both ways because ultimately they also have their fiduciary responsibility. If they do something and the money evapor evaporates, it's crazy also. I mean, I'm not defending, I'm not taking a, a side. It's, it's a difficult situation. Um, and um, yeah, all right. So then how was that whole thing? I mean, that must be such a very exciting, right? Running it was the most, most successful uh, social networks, consumer companies, you know, at that time in the region, uh, you know, to a degree, you become a, a little bit of a local celebrity, right? Yeah, it, it was crazy time. I mean, I it's it's just just about executing everything and we're, we're getting a lot of attention. Uh, I remember when we raised capital, uh, we, uh, somebody called us from, from CNN and said, look, we would like to interview uh, Rodrigo. And I was like, I had personally never done any TV interview in my life. And, uh, and I was like, okay. And, and, and they tell him you should come, you should come tomorrow in the afternoon. I was like, Okay, done. You know, it was all about like doing it now and things of sort. So I fly to Atlanta uh, uh, at night, uh, like that day, like two days before. They tell me on this day you should go. I fly. I get there early, and uh, I go to Atlanta to the CNN uh, headquarters over there. And I thought it was going to be a, a, a filmed, but it's actually live. So. I, and, you know, I had never done this and it was all like everything that was happening at, at that time was, you know, getting myself out of my comfort zone. Uh, I definitely not at all was 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 something easy for me to do. Uh, I, it, it was something that uh, I was always pushing myself into. OK, let's do this, even though it generates anxiety to me and things of sort. Uh, I did it. And, uh, and like that with a whole bunch of things, it was very stressful moment, right? I mean, it, I, it was a tug of war of, of figuring out how to scale a business, figuring out how to continue on, uh, building the, the tech team, uh, figuring out how to do all the, the, the branding and, and things are sort of the business. Uh, but, um, it, it was definitely exciting. But going back to, to Sonico, so uh -huh. uh, you ended up in 2014, you sold the company, right? You had about yeah. 55 million registered users. Um, did you, because I remember this is, um, I don't have firsthand knowledge on this, but I've listened, you know, to the folks that used to work at Facebook quite uh, like often. And uh, they had these strategies where they were coming in. And I mean, I remember in Brazil, at least where we had Orkut, right? Uh, yeah. They destroyed Orkut when they decided to come to Brazil. Yeah. So did you face those challenges or was it before Facebook decided to go global? Uh, basically, what was the whole journey? So you raised around, you continue to grow. Um, and, so, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. So we raised around these $4.7 million in early 2008. The business just continued on growing very strongly. And, and you know, network effects are very important and, and virality is very important in all these businesses and the sort. So, I mean, growth at that time was, was critical more than anything else. And, and, and getting to that network effect of, of, of having millions of users and, and, and very engaged and, and, and the sort. So actually what happened like at mid 2008 is that I, I actually get a, an offer to sell the company. And uh, I, I, I was approached by, by three companies. Actually, we, we got an approach from Google from Naspers and from Yahoo at that time. And uh, the, the, the numbers that, that, that were being shared was like around $150 million. And what was interesting about that time was that I, I was actually 80, I owned 80% of the equity at, at that time. 
and uh, it's pretty meaningful outcome yeah so i was like it's a no-brainer you know so 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 basically on on so it was the moment where i i had yahoo naspers and google interested in buying the company for about 150 million dollars and uh at that moment, I had a, a, a huge stake. Uh, almost eighty percent of the business uh, uh, equity was was mine because I actually started the business really early on, bootstrapping the whole thing, and then I raised a little amount of capital, and uh, and I thought it was the moment to sell. So at that time, um, the board, the new investors, said, "You know, let's let's hire an investment bank. Let's hire." Uh, and, and I went to talk to Allen and Company and, and, and some other investment banks. And I remember Allen and Company at that time was trying to sell high five uh, at the moment. So, but in, in those couple of weeks, what happened is that the market started to turn around. I think it was Burr Stearns that, 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 that went bankrupt or Lehman Brothers. I don't remember which one of those two, but, um, Basically, what started to happen was Nasdaq was starting to to crash, you know, and 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 these firms were like, okay, now let's wait and see what happens with the market, and the market just continued on going down and down and down until you know the the, the financial crisis of two thousand eight happened. So um, when you were asking me before what happened after we raised, well, we almost sold the business, and for me it was it was it was a no brainer. Because also the complexities of, 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 of building network effects and having a company such as Facebook that from Silicon Valley could ultimately build a better product and things of the sort. So for me, it was important to, to, to do that. But with a financial crisis, I was, it, it was later impossible. So in 2009, with a whole crisis, uh, happening full blown. I was actually that year I was invited to Davos and I was actually a speaker and, and panelist in Davos. And when all this traditional media and, 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 and new media discussions were happening, like what was going to happen uh, with, 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 with these issues. And uh, I kind of realized in, in early 2009 that um, it was going to be very hard for Sonico to compete uh, with the likes of, of Facebook and the sort. I was seeing the global network effect that was uh, taking in effect. And mostly because also there was an aspirational aspect to Facebook. You know, people that maybe had Sonico or could and things of the sort. Culturally, people would see like, oh, Facebook. Well, Facebook is for like people in in, in, in developed countries and and eventually it became a better product. So um, 2009 was a hard year for me because of, of that realization that, that I had lost the boat in a sense of, of, of trying to do the, the VC um, growth spurt, super speed and, 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 and raising capital and, 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 and selling the business. But, um, and, and it was, it was a hard moment. 2009 was a hard moment for me, realizing again that instead of having done the path of organic growth of something that was very sustainable, I tried a superpower, uh, a, a, a product growth, uh, which was very risky. Um, and, uh, and just feeling that, um, it was going to be very hard, uh, to build a sustainable business. Uh, with Sonico. So actually early in 2010, I, I have to fire a whole bunch of people. And I decide that through all the businesses that we had, that we should start and organize the company as a company builder. I mean, we had, you know, the calling card business, the Cumple Alerta, Tu Postal, Sonico. And, and, and we started thinking about other businesses at the same time in 2010. And, and at that moment, one of the realizations that I had was if we have the calling card business, which was the e-commerce part of, 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 of this whole combination of companies, and we had this Sonico that had massive amount of users, millions of users, what was the single biggest problem that we could solve in, in Latin America? And, uh, and, and for me, once 
really studying the market, we realized like, look, there's 600 million people in Latin America, of which there's 500 million phones, of which 80% of those phones are prepaid. And of those, everybody's going physically to stores to pay for their mobile top up. And I said, maybe we can sell these things online through a website and, and, and be something uh, very convenient uh, to customers, right? So, um, I mean, maybe I can come back to, to, to the story, but basically at the end, Sonico, we, we sold it for, for not much money that we eventually used to just funnel more uh, capital into building uh, Ricardo Pay. I see. I see. But then when Match acquired you guys, did yeah. you pay back the investors? And you had this entity as well, which I think it's a function of the stage of when you as a founder, you know, were having your first decade long and how the market would operate, right? Today, because it's just so fast to start a company and raise money, it's so different. Um, probably like each individual product that you've had would have been a different company with like its own yeah. like little lifetime right? Ver versus you throughout this decade, you kind of almost had like this conglomerate of multiple different yeah. businesses, right? So when you yeah. sold it, did you pay back your, um, your no, investors we, or what? what we, because, um, we, yeah. We spun it off. We basically, uh, spun off the business. We didn't sell the company itself. We, 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 we sold it for cash. But the same cap table was maintained. So what's what's kind of crazy also about the these last twenty years is that it's the same cap table since two thousand and two. So everything that we've done, we've done it through wow. the same cap table. But we sold and closed businesses with the same cap table. So the investors that invested in two thousand eight, I still have them for Ricardo Pay. That is very rare. And also, I think it's really interesting and cool because it's a good testament of your character. Uh, I, uh, I've i been in situations of where founders, uh, well, they'll try to, you know, they'll try to fuck investors or, they, or they'll just try to like wipe people out of cap tables or, 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 or the other way around as well. Um, if things don't necessarily go one way or the other. So I think it's, uh, it's actually, it's quite admirable the fact that uh that that's how how you do it at least with a lot of the things that we do with atman you know i always use that word funeral alignment and it's always for the very long term because of the fact that after you know being in business uh for less time than you have for about 12 13 years today i only do business with people that i care right like mm -hmm. that i that i enjoy spending time with because yeah. it gets to a point where you have to make a little bit of money it's not that yeah. much you have to make yeah. a little bit and then you realize yeah. that life isn't about money at all. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, yeah. I think it's really interesting that you have that. Look, I, I personally, I, th I thought it was the, the right thing to do and, and what I felt uh, that, that made sense. I, I, I kind of feel kind of weird when people do a business, they dedicate a year, two years, and then they just, oh, it didn't work and, and they close it. And they even close it with money in the bank. It's like, uh, I, I've seen people that have, oh, I only have one year's worth of, of runway. I'm like, that's a ton of money. Are you money. kidding me? Uh, that's a lot crazy. of money. Exactly. I've been bankrupt for years. I mean, in the, I mean, literally in the business. And what I realized uh, over the years, it's that companies, uh, in, in a sense, don't go bankrupt. It's more about the founders giving up more than anything else. Uh, because if you're a founder, you have to figure it out. There's always ways of, 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 of turning it around in, in a sense. So at least that's my belief. And, uh, and of course, it's not that you can turn absolutely everything around, but thinking that it's, I think the easy way out is saying, okay, well, let's just close it and start something new. Uh, I, I think it's too easy. And, um, I just thought that, um, we were still going to use the same team to build anything new. So I thought it made sense uh, to, to continue having the same cap table uh, and, and the sort. That's great. That's great. And then in terms of, you know, you, where do you get the energy to never give up? Uh, I think being an entrepreneur uh, in, in a sense makes no logical sense because of 
like the amount of effort, energy, and and stuff that you have to to do and accomplish. Uh, but I think it's a it's a personality. I think it's something that I never knew that nobody in my family was an entrepreneur. Uh, nobody that I knew, in a sense. But I just felt the urge of of doing things uh, with uh, with my ideas, with building from scratch. And I just enjoy it. I mean, I, I, I sincerely just enjoy it. I, I, I feel at the end, also the, the amount of time I spend playing games in strategy games like Civilization, Age of Empires and things of sort, it kind of is in a sense, the, the same you're building. And, and I used to play in like expert mode and things of that was just find it really challenging. So actually it's kind of weird, but when things get more challenging, I, I just, it brings even more uh, energy to me uh, in in a sense. Uh, uh, I don't know if that, that happens to other, but it's something that um, uh, I, I kind of feel. I love it. Yeah. I also play a ridiculous amount of Age of Empire. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when, you know, it's like uh, uh, that when like you would have the guy collect little uh, like uh, plant something and he would say Zukanta. Remember, like I don't know yeah. why that this came to my mind right yeah. now. <laughs> well, I remember the little, the playing. Little... I would stop playing when 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 the sunrise would come up. I said, "Oh fuck, <laughs> I played all night." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was really funny, and, and the little the little priest guy mm -hmm. that would like convert, you know, folks from the other teams, yeah. and um, yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, so, so it's like you is was Alvaro always with you, and uh, do you always did you always have a co-founders, or was it more of like a solo thing as you brought partners with some bigger participation? You know, your your so, entire journey until now. So I went from zero to one uh, on my own um, from two thousand two, um, and uh, so the building of the calling card business really started uh, once I reached like a million dollars in 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 revenues. That's when uh, that was like. A year and a half after founding it, which I was doing it from 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 university, right? I was I didn't have no official office or anything. I had programmers in Ukraine. My girlfriend was the graphic designer. I had some customer support in in in, in Argentina, but um, I I always wanted to actually work with my brother because we had actually done so many things in the past online. But he wanted to finish school, right? He wanted to finish. A business school that, that, that he finished. And, um, so, but, but so, you know, you know, the company in, in Delaware, when I started in, in this business, the calling card business, I actually called it Clon Communications because between my brother and myself, we call each other Clon. It's not like a clone. Uh, and, and, and I, and I created the, the, the name of the business was called Clon Communications Clon because I said, we're going to work together. You'll see. <laughs> and, uh, and I actually, right after he That's finished cool. school business, I said, look, you're out of, you're out of school now. Come on. Let's, let's, let's do something together. I mean, with a business. And, and he started off basically, uh, doing the whole strategy of AdWords in, in 2003. And he did just like an amazing job. Of, of, of going very meticulous with very specific, um, uh, keywords, you know, like call from, uh, Los Angeles to Buenos Aires, call from Kazakhstan to the U.S. And, and he went very precise and we would bid for ver each one very differently. We would get how much conversions we would get for everything. So we had like thousands of, of, of lines of, of with, all the text different. We would A-B test, that he would do it. You know, he would A-B test the titles, the links, the landing pages, the whole thing. And, and, and at that moment, the business really like took off even faster. And, um, so from there, he, he eventually became the, the, the CTO of the company. He's always been, uh, very autodidacta and, uh, and, uh, he's just been amazing at that. And, and with time, um, he he started receiving 
chunks of equity. You know, he kept on uh, executing and, 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 and things of the sort. But for many years, I was just more of a solo. And today I really believe like over like probably like 2008, 2009, I do believe like they are full like co-founders with me because so much story uh, ha- has happened. And, and uh, maybe at the start, I wouldn't share most of the, uh, of, of the problems that you had at a CEO level. Once you start sharing all the stuff that happens and things, and that probably happened when we raised capital in 2008, that, um, that all this stuff that happened that we had an investor and then they, they didn't come. And then all that, um, is, is really when they became full blown, which is Alvaro and Gustavo, which I asked my brother, who's the smartest guy that you could recommend me uh, from your university? And this was Gustavo Victorica. Today, he was the CFO. Now he's the COO of the company. And he said, it's Gustavo. And I interview him. And, and this was just right out. He said economics. And, and I try to hire him right, right after school. And he, he, he let me down. He said, you know what? I'm going to go to, um, uh, I think it was, um, one of these, um, financial companies and, uh, but he like lasted six months there. And six months later, he called me and he said, you know what? I, I, I'd love to work with you. And, um, and he actually had done like a semester in Wharton and he, he didn't know this before, but, uh, when he went to Wharton, I had actually launched the business in 2002 and I told him, Hey, why don't you test out and buy a calling card in, in Tarjetas Telefonicas? And he was the actually first customer of that business ever. Like the, the more, like the, the organic, uh, customer. Uh, when he came into the company months later or uh, more than a year later, then he realized, wait, I'm ID number three because I was ID number one and my programmer was, uh, no, I was ID number two. My programmer was ID number one and, and Gustavo was ID number three as, as user ID. And, uh, and even today, since that database has, has kind of like the, the basis of Recargo Pay actually started with most of the code from Tarjetas Telefonicas. If you actually see the user it. ID, of uh, Rodrigo Tejero and Ricardo Pace, number two. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> That's great. I think, I mean, this is uh, the, the whole ethos of the podcast is to really tell the story of some magical people with, you know, that whole Joseph Campbell hero's journey. And I think yours fits that whole ethos so perfect, you know. Um, which, you know, like now, you know, whereas we're talking about like the act three, the return, basically, right? And then I'd say that probably, um, when is it that things uh, started working out with Ricardo? For those that don't know, they're listening for the first time. Maybe you want to talk a little bit more about what is Ricardo Pay and its uh, scale, right? You said, you know, over 250 employees and how much money you've raised. And I know that it wasn't easy. We had the whole conversation as well about uh, about Miami. We'll get there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that tons of stuff. Uh, but, so. But- yeah. Yeah. So Ricardo Bay today is like we're we're doing over a billion dollars in 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 GTV, uh, over fifty million dollars in revenue. We have three hundred fifty employees, and uh, we've raised about a hundred million dollars in, in in venture capital, basically. And uh, we share that we're a uh, beat that break even, which is kind of weird for fintech nowadays, but uh, it's a business that that uh, started basically by solving one very specific use case, which was allowing people to pay their mobile top-ups in a website in 2010. In 2014, we allowed people to do that from a mobile app. Basically, that was accomplished by integrating directly to telcos, directly to choirs, and everything in the middle of the full stack of payments we developed internally. So we are gateway PCI compliant level one, we are we manage our KYC, the whole stack of, of, of payments. And through that, that that use case and that capability of allowing people to pay uh, digital goods with credit card not present transactions, we added a whole array of different uh, uh, verticals. So now you can pay bills, you can pay public transportation, you can pay gift cards. And then we started layering on top financial services. So 
now you can pay all these things in installments. We lend you money. Uh, you, you have a subscription model that is working extremely well. And not only is it for consumers, but it's also for merchants. So Recarga Pay today is used by dozens of thousands of merchants in Brazil that if they, if they have a small kiosk, let's say, and they want to have incoming traffic into their shop, they can put outside of their shop that they resell top ups and, and Google Play and Netflix and bills and public transportation. And then that uh, store owner can resell it by using a uh, recargo pay. We lend money to these merchants. Um, so the mission of the, of the company has been to democratize mobile payments and financial services in Brazil. We started out the business by having this top up business in nine countries in Latin America. And in 2015, we doubled down and closed everything and went directly all in uh, with Brazil. So, and today we're a hundred percent Brazil focused and, um, and, and the business is, is, is just growing tremendously at super scale. That's awesome. Um, and there was a point in time where, uh, you were like, I'm not going to live in Argentina anymore. I want to move to the U S and, um, now, you know, I've been here for 12 years in, in the U S three Colorado, nine in San Francisco and, uh, three weeks in Miami. <laughs> so, uh, well, how is the decision, uh, you know, to go to Miami versus, uh, other parts of the U S because the Miami, when that, that, that you moved to, it was very different than the Miami of today. We were even talking about the food traffic in, in brick or like I bump into San Francisco people here now. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the situation of moving, it was like in 2014 when I realized after like spending 30 years in Argentina, having studied economics and trying to figure out why countries grow and, and, and things of sort, realizing that it was becoming a lost case in uh, Argentina. And, and I was seeing that it wasn't going to be able to turn around the situation in Argentina. And I said, you know what? Um, I, 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 the conversations with friends, it was always very depressing. Uh, everything that you saw that the government did every single week was completely the opposite that should have happened. Uh, there was more violence happening in the streets. And it was extremely frustrating, uh, basically, to, to be in Argentina. But... We had a business that was all across Latin America at that time, and we had nine countries in, in Latin America, but also a big chunk in Brazil. So the logic, if I left Argentina, it made sense to go to Brazil, but being an entrepreneur and, and, and having a family, being an entrepreneur, a husband is, is already complex, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of time of work and, and stress and things of sort. Moving my family to Brazil in a different culture, in a city like Sao Paulo. Uh, I thought it was too harsh on my family. So then I started thinking, what if I move to the U.S. Uh, in, in a sense? And, um, and when, I, when I started thinking about the U.S., it was actually just like three cities. It was either New York, San Francisco, or Miami. And I actually really started looking into uh the, the the pros and cons of of each city and uh, i realized well first m new york and san francisco crazy expensive um then san francisco super far away from everything like uh, if i wanted to work uh, with argentina uh, and brazil time zone was an issue the airport in san francisco is not great and um I think the airport is great. The issue is that you don't have direct flights everywhere. I actually think SFO is better than 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 Miami. The Miami airport, Miami airport takes you everywhere. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, it's just it, at least for, for me. I don't know. The Wi-Fi and SFO is awesome, and it, and and the, and the terminals they all look like co-working spaces. So it's literally you get there, it's just a bunch of people getting shit done. Miami, I mean, in the amount of fist fights that I've seen sometimes. At the Miami then, airport. The other, then the other thing that I saw in San Francisco also is that it was a very early bird society. I mean, and, and oh, yeah. I'm, I'm more of a night owl. 
And at the same gotcha. time, I also saw very boring. Um, uh, since I like, there wasn't anything to do at night. Uh, honestly. Uh, oh the, yeah, the, the, that is yeah. You it's all it's all about hiking uh, and uh, cycling, and then the parties that are allegedly cool in San Francisco. I can say that as having lived there for nine years. For me. They're just super fucking weird. I mean, I honestly, like, this is a whole thing. You know, uh, I never understood why these like, these people love Burning Man so much. Uh, I don't know if you, I mean, and I look like I even got to a point where I had tickets to go to Burning Man. And then I sold them uh, for a profit. I, I wanted to go. I, ne I never went. I never went. It's something that, uh, I, just, that I have, something that uh, I wanted to test out. But I, the, the issue was... I, I, the other issue was that probably if if uh, again thinking like these different cities if if I didn't have a girlfriend I wouldn't go to San Francisco I mean and uh, probably if I didn't have a girlfriend I would I would probably go to New York um, or, or Miami if I had a girlfriend I would probably go to I, w I wouldn't mind and go to San Francisco but if I had kids going to San Francisco with kids. Like uh, or New York because like six months in a year be super cold and uh, and to live well in any of these uh, cities you got to be filthy rich uh, so I the, the combination came down to okay I'm married I have my kids uh, what's the soft landing that that I could do time zone airport um, uh, weather you know my wife didn't like cold much so I mean. Miami kind of fit the bill. I also realized that a, a ton of friends and people come by Miami, just insane. And also saw insane. that. I insane. have hosted four people in three weeks. I didn't have my furniture here and I already had an air bed in the den of the apartment. Uh, that is great. Because in nine years in San Francisco, maybe I hosted four friends. Here in three weeks, I've hosted four friends. Yeah, look, it's it's a city that's very connected uh, with Latin America. It, it has really good access, and um, it's it's the place I found here in Key Biscayne is also fantastic. And my kids go in, in their bikes to school. Uh, everything is close by. I kite surf. I can kite from from the beach. Uh, I live basically on 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 the beach. I can do sports. Just I finish work and I go directly and I do an hour, uh, an hour of sports every day of something, either my bike or soccer or kite or walk uh, or tennis. And um, it's just been something that that has allowed me, in a sense, being here of just thinking that I could actually pursue this this life of as an entrepreneur for many, many years, you know, and uh because it comes down to the point where uh, how can you balance uh, the, the life in a sense, right? And I think that once you're an entrepreneur, re you realize that balancing is almost is, is impossible, but you should never try to stop and balance it. You, you should never, you should always try to do it, right? Uh, because um, sometimes you get too obsessive uh, with things and uh, you got to figure out uh, um, how to manage stress, anxiety, uh, challenging moments. And with time, I've, I've just learned to do a whole bunch of stuff, right? So I started meditating. I do yoga every week. I do sports every single day. Um, oh, dude, you got, we got to do a yoga class together that I've been doing. Yeah. And uh, if Brickle Keys is not that far away from you, but I met mm -hmm. in, in my building, this Brazilian teacher, amazing. Uh -huh. It's the best yoga class I have ever, or, but I'm happy to go to Kibi Skin and do yoga with yeah. you as well. I just, yeah. uh, yoga has been transformational for me. It, it's fantastic. And uh, I actually did it when I was in LA in, in 2003 for the first time with, 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 with my girlfriend back there, my wife today. And I actually stopped doing it once I left uh, Los Angeles. And I, I started it again, like, uh, last, like last year. And I had started meditating like seven, eight years ago, but yoga is even more complete in, 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 in a sense, in, in, in the sense of, 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 uh, the combination of it's like a meditation, 
and and it's great for for your body for stretching and uh, I don't know I just love it and uh, it, it it makes a big difference uh, uh, for my for day me day. as well. So there are days you wake up you want to assassinate the world and then it yeah. puts you at ease and you're yeah. like no be calm yeah like, yeah integrate definitely. surrender. <laughs> So, so Miami has been has been awesome in, in in that front. But of course, five years ago when I came here, the problem with Miami was that I would tell people I'm in Miami, and they would there were just like two two faces, or or you're retired, they would say, oh, oh you're you retired, or you're out to party every day. It's like, yeah, send me a picture of your purple Lambo, bro. Yeah, it's like <laughs> there, there was no alternative, and, and it was just weird, you know, in, in a sense, and. And, and, you know, like I shared before, I actually started the business remote, right? I was in Los Angeles. I had a team of program, Ukraine programmers in Ukraine, customer support in Argentina. So for me, like all the, the condiments for, for, for remote work have been in place for, for a long time now. And, um, and, and, and for me, it just, I, I thought I could pull it off, but. It, it clearly was an issue when raising capital. I, I realized like the business was doing fantastic unit economics, growth and everything. But once they heard like I was in Miami, it was like, hmm, that's kind of weird. Uh, and, and I think that the pandemic has really like changed the mindset of like the, the, the most uh, stringent people that didn't believe that was possible. And people have realized that people can still be productive, sometimes even more productive uh, by, by, by being remote. And, um, and now it's just like, it's not mainstream, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that uh, the, the beautiful thing is that Miami is by far the best place in the, in, in, in the US today to live a post-pandemic life, the hybrid life. Because you have incredible people and interesting things to do offline and then you can continue to be connected globally and you are a flight away from anywhere that kind of matters uh, of that you would be that it would be a place of business specifically if you're doing business between the US and Latin America with maybe you know a little bit of Europe here and there um, I am I am really excited and honestly like the sun has changed my mood. Just nature in general. We have incredible nature in, in California. And, you know, I still have a place in Palo Alto. We still have offices there. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not even sure when I'm going to go there again. I know. I mean, I, I will be there in August. But uh, in, in a sense, it's like I don't want to leave. I really enjoy being here. And the heat doesn't annoy me at all. I mean, maybe we're just getting started because it's May. <laughs> Look, but, I, I thought the heat was going to be very annoying, and I'm I'm completely used to it. And and honestly, the only moment that that, that is warm really is like May, June, July, and like at noon. But since I live close to the beach, you know, after five p.m. is like perfect. You can do anything. Um, of course, you're not going to play soccer or any sports at noon because you're just melt in, in, in those times. But um, I, I think it's just a an amazing gem that people are starting to realize. And and people, you know, it's like, uh, again, going back to my sister that studied in Stanford and then she moved to New York, super New Yorker. Uh, you know, she's, she was living there for 10 years and, and, and she would think like, no, New York, you know, intellectual conversations, art, culture. And when she would think about Miami, she would say like, you know, it's, there's nothing there. You know, it's just a party and, and that's it. But once you realize there's way more, interesting people in Miami than, 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 than people actually realize and, and, and come to the fact that now she moved here to Miami. So, <laughs> and, 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 and she was going to come for a couple of months and now she's staying until the end of the year. And, uh, so, so, you know, I, I think that what Miami has is this conversion ratio, you know, that is just incredible. People come for a week, then they come for a month and then they stay a little bit longer and they said, you know, I could actually live here. And, and that's what's the interesting th thing about the magic city today is, is, is that it has high conversion, high retention. Absolutely. Oh, that is a great high note for us to end, uh, our conversation. There's just so much more, uh, but you know, Rodrigo, I, again, I really appreciate your, your honesty and, 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 and heartfelt sincerity. This was a wonderful chat. Uh, and you know, I know how precious your time is. So I thank you so much for, 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 for the time here.
No, and thank you, Pedro, for inviting me. It was it was a pleasure to have this conversation with you, and 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 and, and hopefully, the way I've learned, you guys have learned something from from your experience. I, I I've just always enjoyed so much hearing from other entrepreneurs, and uh, and if I can help in in in, in seeing all the errors I have also also committed, and just keep on going. That makes all the difference, right? <laughs> Thank you, man. Take care. Un abrazo. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode with Rodrigo. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, we are available on all major podcasting platforms. I now understand why all these uh, producers and content creators continue to ask for people to subscribe and do a little thumbs up because that does really help. So if you feel like we're adding value to your life in one way or the other, help us spread the word and talk a little bit more about what we are doing. Um, there is also another channel called Inevitable Clips where we just have episode highlights. Yeah, it's really cool. You can even build your own playlist of a little, you know, if you've missed a few episodes and you don't want to listen to the entire episodes all the fucking time. Um, but anyway, I want to stay in touch. Hit me up on Twitter uh, or any of the other platforms. I'm Pedro Soren everywhere. And uh, see you and on the next episode. Thank you. <laughs>